Hi, my name is Glenn Alexander Thompson. So that you may see who I am, I have placed a photograph of myself on the bottom left of the screen. Now, because my natural voice is a slow Aussie draw, I am using a much faster computer-generated voice for narration. Now, in this video, amongst other things, I am going to demonstrate that Victoria's so-called anti-corruption commissioner, Robert Redlick, is overtly, criminally corrupt, and should be in jail. In this video, I will demonstrate that in 2009, while he was a judge of the Victorian Court of Appeal, the then Justice Robert Redlick, fraudulently fabricated purported reasons for judgment, for the specific purpose of deceiving the people of Victoria and concealing serial high crime and corruption in the Victorian court system. I will particularly demonstrate, that Redlick concealed that Justice Robert Osborne, had fabricated purported reasons for judgment, for the specific purpose of concealing, that while a mere barrister, the now Major General Justice Greg Gard, conspired with the ANZ bank solicitor, John Norman Price, to commit perjury and rely upon falsified documents to deceive a court, and to thereby conceal and deny the facts behind the serious property fraud which had been described in the Victorian Parliament. At that time an ANZ Bank subsidiary, and its solicitor, John Norman Price, were party to that serious property fraud. So, Ridlick knowingly and purposefully fabricated his purported reasons for judgment for the dual purpose of concealing the corrupt conduct of his brother judge and also concealing the overtly corrupt conduct of the ANZ Bank subsidiary and its solicitor, and the now Major General Justice Greg Gard. Significantly, each and every one of the ANZ Bank directors, shown on the screen now, and the ANZ executive are sufficiently aware that that chain of high crime and corruption originated with the overtly wrongful and corrupt conduct of the ANZ subsidiary and its solicitor. Not surprisingly they collectively and individually refused my request that they stand up in respect of the facts known to them. Their refusal to stand up is one of the reasons why the corruption that I am about to particularize is rampant. So follow me closely. I will get straight to the details. On the screen now is the header page of purported reasons for judgment. Those purported reasons were co-authored by Redlick while he was a judge of the Victorian Court of Appeal. On the screen now is paragraph 10 of those purported reasons. In that paragraph underlined in red, Redlick says that I made a number of serious allegations about the trial judge and lawyers who appeared in that proceeding. That trial judge referred to by Redlick was Justice Robert Osborne, and one of the legal representatives was the then soon-to-be Victorian judge, Justice Greg Gard, who at that time was a mere, crooked, senior barrister. Then underlined in blue. Redlick said that while he held a belief as to my serious allegations, my beliefs involve a serious misunderstanding of the evidence and its legal implications. Then underlined in green. Redlick said that no material had been advanced by written or oral submissions, which might on any view, support my serious allegations. So in other words, Redlick said that I was a nincompoop and there was no evidence as to my allegations against Justice Robert Osborne or the lawyers, including Gard. Now, my specific allegations against Osborne included that in 2007 he corruptly fabricated purported reasons for judgment which were contrived to conceal the corrupt conduct of a number of lawyers and others. As this video progresses, I will name those lawyers and others. On the screen now is the header page of Osborne's purported reasons for judgment. Now, as I will shortly demonstrate, Osborne's purported reasons were so crassly fabricated that the fraud and corruption of Justice Robert Osborne was self-evident to any mildly competent person, including Robert Redlick, who read Osborne's purported reasons. On the screen now is paragraph 17 and 18 of those purported reasons. Now, as you can see those paragraphs are under the heading, Woodley Land Factual Background. The so-called Woodley Land was a cluster subdivision to the north of the township of Kyneton, Victoria. Now, at his paragraph 17, Osborne accurately says that I purchased a number of cluster allotments within the so-called Woodley Land. Now, of significance at his paragraph 18, Underlined in red, Osborne says that a dispute arose because the subdivider withheld a reticulated water supply from my land. Then, underlined in blue, Osborne says that in 1982 water was supplied by the water board to the subdivision. So, in other words, Osborne said that the private property subdivider, withheld from me, water that was supplied to the subdivision, by the statutory water authority being the water board. Now, on the mere face of it, that paragraph cannot be true. Manifestly, as every Australian possessed of a modicum of common sense including Robert Redlick would know. Firstly, it is manifestly obvious that water cannot be supplied to an inanimate object such as a subdivision. Clearly, water may only be supplied to a consumer such as a natural person or corporation. Now, this is not semantics, I am teaching you how judges commit fraud and deceive the common person, and in this instance, as I will show, 
Osborne's statement that water was supplied to the subdivision was a very careful and purposeful misrepresentation of fact. Now, it is self-evident that a private builder, or subdivider, or anyone else for that matter, simply cannot withhold water or electricity or any other essential service which is supplied, by a statutory authority, to a natural person, in this case me. So, it is obvious that from a simple reading of paragraph 18 of Osborne's purported reasons, the then Justice Robert Redlick, knew well that Osborne's purported reasons were at least in grave error, and could not be true, in those respects or aspects. Okay, so now we will have a look at some of the pertinent and ineluctable facts which were squarely before and known to Robert Redlick. On the screen now, is a Google Earth photograph of Kyneton Township and its surroundings. On that photograph, I have delineated the various so-called water districts which were published in the Victorian Government Gazette and which existed at the relevant times. The large, essentially square area delineated in green is the so-called Kyneton Water District. Now within that district, outlined in yellow, I have delineated the so-called Kyneton Urban District. That district was also published in the Government Gazette. Now, the law was quite simple. Firstly, consumers within the Urban District were entitled, by right, to a guaranteed water supply. Secondly, outside the urban district, no right or entitlement to water supply existed at all. However, outside the urban district, if it wished, by a written agreement, the water authority could provide a non-guaranteed water supply to a consumer for industrial or pastoral purposes. Thirdly, except with the consent of the governor and council, the water board could not provide water for use on land outside the green water district. Now, the further fact known to Redlick was that the so-called Woodley land is that area of land delineated by that red square towards the top of the screen. Now, as you can see that subdivision was outside the urban district, and about 50% of it was outside the Green Waterworks district. So the further facts, known to Robert Redlick, were that to be lawful, there must be a written water supply agreement, and that the supply must have the consent of the governor and council. Okay, on the screen now is a copy of the first page of the so-called water supply agreement dated the 1st of January 1982. Overlaid on that is a close-up of the first paragraph or recitals to that agreement. Now, as you can see that agreement is between the Kyneton Shire Waterworks Trust, as the water board then was, and the private company named Woodley Heights Resort Developments Proprietary Limited. Also, as you can see, underlined in red, that agreement represents that that company was the owner or occupier of the whole of the land comprising the cluster subdivision. Now, as you can see the water supply agreement was not an agreement to supply water to the subdivision. Instead, it was an agreement to supply water to the corporate entity. Woodley Heights Resort Developments Proprietary Limited who was specifically said to be the consumer. So from that primary document alone, Redlick knew well that Osborne's paragraph 18 was overtly false with no possible basis in either fact or law. Now, Redlick knew that I had purchased my land in November 1979, and he also knew that the company, being the consumer, named in the water supply agreement did not exist until it was incorporated on 10th of March 1981. So, Robert Redlick was well aware that the company named in the water supply agreement was not the subdivider and never was either owner or occupier of my land, and manifestly that company never was and never could be the owner or occupier of the 30 acres or 14 hectares of common property which was by law owned by the corporate body of the cluster subdivision. So Robert Redlick was well aware that the representations in the water supply agreement were palpably false. Now, Osborne's paragraph 18 is back on the screen. So, Robert Redlick knew well that the representation in Osborne's paragraph 18 were entirely false and had no possible basis in fact or law. Okay, on the screen now is Osborne's paragraph 19. Now, in that paragraph, Osborne says two things. Firstly, underlined in black he accurately states that in 1995 I sued the Council and Water Authority. Then, underlined in red, Osborne said that in that 1995 proceeding I alleged that the Council and Water Authority fraudulently represented that I had no entitlement to access the water supply from the Water Authority when in truth I was entitled to access to such water supply. In other words, in simple terms, Osborne's paragraph 19 states that in 1995 I sued the Council and Water Authority because I was wrongfully denied access to the water supply from the Water Authority. Now, as I have already discussed, the whole of my land was wholly outside the Kyneton Urban District and no right or entitlement to water from the Water Authority existed at all. So, manifestly I could not sue for denial of water which I was not entitled to and I did not. As Robert Redlick knows, Osborne's paragraph 19 was and remains a very purposeful fabrication. Now, in order that you, my viewers may see that Osborne's paragraph 19 is a completely false fabrication, in the description of this video, 
I have included links to the complete copies of my writ and statement of claim in the 1995 proceeding referred to by Osborne. For those who care to look, you will see that Osborne is a bald-faced liar and Robert Redlick is aware of that fact. Okay, so now I will shortly show the daisy chain of court-based high crime and corruption where Redlick was merely the most recent poisonous daisy in that daisy chain. That chain began when in 1988 an ANZ Bank subsidiary conspired with its then solicitor, John Norman Price, to use the courts as a tool of fraud in respect of my land. In turn, John Norman Price engaged the then junior barrister Greg Gard to commit the fraud upon the court. I will explain that beginning shortly. Both Robert Redlick and a number of other Court of Appeal judges, whom I will discuss later, fabricated their reasons and orders to continuously conceal the court corruption which began with Price and Gard and the ANZ Bank subsidiary. Now, first I must provide a little background. In 1978 the council issued a planning permit which allowed the cluster subdivision. Because the proposed subdivision was substantially outside the waterworks district the council did not refer the plans to the water authority and did not and could not make water supply from the authority a condition or requirement of the subdivision. Roof rainwater tanks were the approved and only possible source of domestic water. However, that subdivision included a large lake having a surface area of about six acres, and because each of the allotments was large enough for owners to have horses or other livestock the council approved a reticulated water supply from the lake to each allotment. That water was for non-domestic, water for livestock, toilet flushing, and the like. Provision of that reticulation system and non-domestic water supply was a condition of the planning permit. Each of those things was particularly set out in the substantial written submission referred to in Clause 8 of the planning permit, and which submission was in evidence before each of the Victorian judges, including Justice Robert Osborne and Justice Robert Redlick. As I said earlier, I purchased my allotments in November 1979 for 145179 dollars Then without my knowledge, about six months later, my land became key to Victoria's very first timeshare resort. At that time, that proposed timeshare project had an estimated market value of about $300 million in today's money. Profit was thought to be a substantial portion of that $300 million. At that time I was told that some developers wished to purchase my land to develop a retirement village. At that time I entered into an option to purchase agreement with an intended director of the then yet to be incorporated, in fact, timeshare company. Then, unbeknown to me that intended director applied to the council for a planning permit to subdivide all of the cluster subdivision allotments, including my allotments, into three smaller allotments. In November 1980 the council granted planning permit number 2784. Again, because the subdivision was substantially outside the gazetted water district the council did not refer the plans to the water authority and did not and could not make water supply from the water authority a condition of that re-subdivision. Those smaller allotments were in breach of the council's policy for minimum lot sizes in the area surrounding the cluster subdivision. The council's explanation or excuse for allowing below minimum lot sizes was that the proposed timeshare resort would bring substantial financial benefit to Kyneton. That permit was issued with the council's baseless and risky expectation that the then yet to be incorporated timeshare company would purchase the whole of the land in the subdivision, including my land. Then, four months later, in March 1981, the timeshare company was incorporated. The timeshare company then purchased a few of the initial allotments from other people and began construction of the timeshare accommodation. Then on 1st of January 1982, the Water Authority entered into the water supply agreement which I discussed earlier. Now, as discussed earlier the water supply agreement falsely represented that the timeshare company owned or occupied the whole of the land in the subdivision. Now, the law was quite clear, the relevant section of the then Water Act allowed the Water Authority to enter into an agreement with the owner of land, and in this case the Water Authority knew well that the timeshare company was not the owner of my land let alone substantial portion of the balance of the cluster subdivision. The law was also clear that, without the consent of the Governor and Council, the Water Authority could not supply water for use on those allotments and parts of common property that were outside the gazetted waterworks district. So, at the time of entering that agreement, the Water Authority knew well that it could not get Governor and Council approval for that water supply so it did not seek or obtain such approval. On the face of it, The Water Authority entered into that agreement with the risky and careless expectation that the recitals would become true once the timeshare company purchased all of the land and the Water Authority could then legitimize the, at that time, false and illegal agreement. Now, to cut a very long story short, the timeshare company failed to purchase my land. In 1984 and 1985 I attempted to sell my land on the open market. 
On both occasions, the council and its executive fraudulently concealed that roof rainwater tanks were the approved domestic water supply and fraudulently represented that use of my land was dependent upon a domestic water supply from the water authority. On both occasions, the water authority correctly represented, that water from the water authority was not available for use on my land. On both occasions, the council concealed that the non-domestic water supply from the lake was the approved reticulated water supply for use on my land. Those fraudulent representations, by the council, rendered my land unusable and worthless. Therefore, on both occasions, I was forced to cancel my proposed auctions. On, each occasion, immediately after I was forced to cancel my proposed sales the timeshare company offered to purchase my land at less than half its true market value and less than half that which it had previously agreed to pay for it. Manifestly the council and water authority were engaged in fraud against me for the purpose of preventing the sale of my land on the open market. Manifestly, at the time of making their representations, each of the individual councillors and the council executive were well aware that their representations in respect of water supply were fraudulently false. At those times I was ignorant of the law in the various water districts. However, I was incredulous, I had purchased valuable and usable land which somehow had been rendered useless and valueless. On 21st of November 1985, the then Victorian Member of Parliament, Max MacDonald MLA, raised the then known aspects in the Victorian Parliament. The Ministers for Local Government and Water Supply purported to institute an inquiry, but did not. They instead relied upon the false, fraudulent, and fallacious representations from the Council and Water Authority and their solicitors. For example, by letter dated 7th of October 1986 the Water Authority solicitor, Ian Lonnie, fraudulently advised the Minister for Water, Andrew McCutcheon, the palpable nonsense that the question of water supply to my land was a matter between me and the timeshare company. In other words, the Water Authority solicitor, Ian Lonnie, preposterously represented, that my neighbor, the timeshare company, controlled the water supply for use on my land. At that time I was ignorant of the law, but, I was possessed of enough common sense to know that, that representation could not be true in fact or law. On the face of it, the Minister for Water did not have that level of common sense. In full view of the ministers, the obvious fraud by the council and water authority continued unabated. At that time, because I was prevented from dealing in my land, I fell into default with my mortgagee which was an ANZ bank subsidiary. By late 1987, I had been in default for a couple of years, and the ANZ bank subsidiary and its solicitors were well aware of all of the then known circumstances of the palpable fraud by the council and water board. In those circumstances, neither I nor the ANZ subsidiary as mortgagee could sell my land. At those times I was required to report regularly to the ANZ subsidiary, in particular to its solicitor, John Norman Price, to advise them as to progress that would enable me to sell my land. In late 1987, I became aware that the timeshare company intended to appeal the council's refusal to issue building permits in respect of some allotments which the timeshare company intended to sell on the open market for ordinary residential use, rather than timeshare use. I informed Price and the ANZ subsidiary that I intended to appear at the tribunal hearing and make submissions as to the unlawful nature and obviously fraudulent effect of the purported water supply agreement. My purpose was to have the water supply agreement declared unlawful and thereby force a reversion to the circumstances that existed when I purchased the land and prior to the existence of the water supply agreement, at which time my land was valuable and usable. Immediately after I informed Price of my intentions, by mail of Friday 11th December 1987, Price and the ANZ subsidiary served me with a Supreme Court writ seeking orders for possession of my land. There was no legitimate purpose for taking possession. The land was vacant land, there were no rents receivable, and in the circumstances of the fraud, Price and the ANZ subsidiary knew well that they could not offer my land for a mortgagee sale. I intended to defend that application, so under the court rules, because there was an intervening weekend service in the ordinary course of the mail was deemed to have occurred by about the 16th. I therefore had until about the 26th of December 1987 to file my notice of appearance. Within time I attended the court to file my notice of appearance and was informed that default judgment had been made against me on 22nd December. When I inquired how that was possible the court gave me a copy of the affidavit of service that had been sworn by Price and that the court relied upon to make its default judgment. Price's affidavit falsely represented that he had served the writ by mail of 9th December. Being shocked by this development, I visited the post office that Price swore that he had posted the writ at. I took a photograph of the inside of the post office and in particular the sign related to Frank Mail. I then spoke with the postal manager, Mr. Brian Sheehan and with the mail clerk, Debbie Morris. 
I made notes of our conversations. They told me that they check the date on franked mail and alter and read if incorrect and that the date on the envelope is the day that it was posted and that is the end of it. I concluded that Price's affidavit of service was false. I then discovered that with the knowledge and consent of the ANZ subsidiary, its solicitor, John Norman Price, was acting as solicitor for the timeshare company. In the forthcoming tribunal hearing, it was manifest that both the ANZ subsidiary and Price knew that Price had a serious and irreconcilable conflict of interest. Manifestly, Price could not honestly act in the interest of my land or the ANZ subsidiary while concurrently acting for the timeshare company, which was party to the fraud against me and which fraud was against the ANZ subsidiary as well. I immediately complained to and met with the executive of the ANZ subsidiary on two occasions. In January 1988, I met with the ANZ officer, Mr. Day Smythe and John Price. On those occasions, I explained the manifest conflict of interest, namely that the purported water supply agreement was at the root of my problems and Price could not represent both my land and the timeshare company in respect of that agreement. At those times, Smith and Price informed me that Price was representing the interest of the ANZ subsidiary in my land at the forthcoming tribunal hearing. The fact of those meetings and the representations made by Smythe and Price are now set out in a letter which I sent the chairman of the ANZ subsidiary. The chairman undertook to review and reply but never did. In February 1988 I wrote to Price and confirmed my allegation that he had a conflict of interest in acting for both the ANZ subsidiary and the timeshare company. The underlying facts are unequivocally that the ANZ subsidiary and Price were absolutely aware that the water supply was a fraudulent document. Those facts include that at all relevant times the ANZ subsidiary was the mortgagee of my land and they were well aware that the recitals to the water supply agreement were false. In particular, the ANZ subsidiary was well aware that the timeshare company never was and could not be the owner or occupier of either my land or the extensive common property. I will discuss this aspect further after I describe the conduct of Price while representing the timeshare company in the Planning Appeals Tribunal hearing. The tribunal hearing was heard on 7th of March 1988. The tribunal allowed me to make my submission. Then under instruction from Price, and while purportedly acting in the interest of the ANZ subsidiary, while a mere barrister, under instruction from Price, the now Major General Justice Greg Gard, overtly deceived the tribunal. First of all, Gard represented me to be a troublemaking former owner whose land was under the control of a mortgagee. The representation that I was a former owner was only true because the ANZ subsidiary had belatedly taken possession of my land. Guard then read from a written submission prepared by him. In his paragraph 4.0 Guard represented that the water supply agreement was legal and enforceable. In paragraph 4.2, Guard represented that under the agreement, the water authority was obliged to provide water to the estate. By his paragraph 4.2 Guard intended to, and did, deceive the tribunal, and lead it into a false belief that, under the water supply agreement, water was provided to the estate. In other words, Guard fraudulently represented that water was available to all owners of all of the allotments in the subdivision. At the time of making that representation, Price and Guard were well aware that water was not available to my land, and that Guard's representation was palpably false in fact and law. Then, in paragraph 4.5, Guard represented that under the agreement, the water authority could not refuse supply to people who were being provided with water or who were entitled to expect the provision of water. At the time of making that representation, Price and Guard were well aware that outside of the Kynan Urban Waterworks District, no entitlement to a water supply, existed at all. Then the solicitor for the Council and Water Authority made his written submission. That solicitor was Ian Lonnie, the selfsame solicitor who, as discussed earlier, had deceived the Minister for Water. In his submission, Lonnie defined the timeshare company as Woodley Heights. Lonnie then represented that the water supply agreement was an agreement to provide water to the land. That was a fraudulent representation that the water supply was to all owners of all of the allotments. Then overtly fraudulently. Ian Lonnie falsely represented that. The timeshare company developed the cluster subdivision in the late 1970s and early 1980s. In support of that fraudulently false representation, an appendix to Lonnie's written submission was a document entitled Woodley Heights History. As I will shortly show, that document was fabricated by the council to conceal the fact that the timeshare company did not exist until 1981 and was not the developer or subdivider of the subdivision. Now, the critical points in that little sequence of overtly false submissions are. Firstly, by fraudulently representing that the timeshare company was the subdivider slash developer, the council and water authority provided superficial legitimacy to the, in fact, illegal and fraudulent water supply agreement. Secondly, 
that representation concealed the fact of the fraud against me and against the ANZ subsidiary. In particular, by representing the timeshare company as the subdivider slash developer, the council and water authority made it appear that the timeshare company, as subdivider slash developer, and the water authority, had legitimately entered into the water supply agreement for the purpose of providing a water supply that would be available to all subsequent owners of all of the allotments, including myself. So, in that little sequence of submissions, it is clear that unless Guard was pre-assured that Lonnie would fraudulently represent that the timeshare company was the subdivider, Guard could not have contemplated representing to the effect that the water supply agreement was an agreement to provide water to the estate, for the benefit of all subsequent owners of individual allotments. So, on the face of it, It must be that prior to the hearing, Price and Guard and the ANZ subsidiary conspired with the Council and the Water Authority, and their solicitor, to make complimentary false submissions, which were intended to, and did conceal, the flagrant fraud against me which had been described in the Victorian Parliament. The simple fact is that Lonnie's overtly false misrepresentations provided superficial verisimilitude to Guard's overtly false misrepresentations. It must be that for the purpose of making my land saleable by mortgagee sale, the ANZ subsidiary conspired with at least price for the purpose of deceiving the tribunal and thereby having the tribunal publish a decision making the in fact palpably illegal water supply appear to be the legitimate water supply to the various present and potential future owners of all of the allotments. In the face of facts and the clear law, the careless tribunal accepted the overtly false and fraudulent submissions of Guard and Lonnie. In its written reasons, the tribunal noted that I was a former owner and entirely disregarded my accurate submissions. Then the tribunal wrongly said that pursuant to the agreement, the timeshare development is supplied with water from the water authority. That erroneous conclusion flowed from the overtly fraudulent representation that the timeshare company was the subdivider slash developer of the entire subdivision. Also, the tribunal wrongly said that since 1976, the timeshare company made a series of subdivisions. The tribunal ordered that the council must issue building permits. That order by the tribunal was irrelevant and moot. The simple ineluctable fact was that, at law, no one had an entitlement to water supply from the water authority. The ANZ subsidiary and its solicitor, John Norman Price and Guard, and the council solicitor, had destroyed my one opportunity to overcome the fraud by having the water supply agreement recognized as illegal and cancelled. That fraud upon the court, by the ANZ subsidiary, and the lawyers, in fact perpetuated the fraud against me. Under the noses of the ministers for local government and water supply. The fraud then continued unabated for the next several years. During that period, because of the continuing fraud, the ANZ subsidiary and price, could not, and did not, offer my land for legitimate sale. In February 1990, in the circumstances of the ongoing fraud, the ANZ subsidiary sold my land to Deckwood Proprietary Limited, a company controlled by the children of the director of the then timeshare company. That mortgagee sale was made without advertising my land for sale, and without conducting a mortgagee's auction or any other type of orderly sale. The arbitrarily agreed price of $7,500 per block represents less than one-third of the true value of my blocks on the open market, and a fraction of the value to the timeshare company, that, in fact, obtained my land. Significantly, the chairman of directors of the timeshare company, Kenneth Raymond Buchanan, was a signatory to the fraudulent water supply agreement. By selling my land in those circumstances, the ANZ subsidiary and its solicitor John Norman Price were each well aware that they had completed the fraud against me that had been described in the Victorian Parliament. In those circumstances and by that chain of events, the ANZ subsidiary, Price, Guard, and the Council and Water Authority, and their solicitor, Ian Lonnie, fair and square, defrauded me and purposefully committed fraud upon the court. The ANZ subsidiary and Price additionally committed fraud upon the court in the Supreme Court when they obtained orders for possession of my land. In particular, they concealed from the Supreme Court that my land could not be offered for sale, or sold, on the open market, and they concealed that with the consent of the ANZ subsidiary, Price was acting as solicitor for the timeshare company that was at the root of the fraud that prevented the sale of my land and had caused my default. In addition, they concealed from the court, that by taking possession of my land I would be deprived of standing to make submissions at the forthcoming tribunal hearing. They additionally concealed from the court that Price intended to make fraudulent submissions to the tribunal and thereby perpetuate the fraud described in Parliament and which fraud had caused my default. That conduct was true, unadulterated overtly criminal fraud upon me and the court. Now, I will shortly return to the fraudulent purported reasons of Redlick and Osborne, but first, for understanding. I will provide a few little fill-in snippets. In about late 1988, not long after the tribunal hearing, I made a submission to the council. 
Then in January 1989, the then Shire engineer, Graham Wilson, prepared a confidential report for all councillors. That report was entitled Woodley Heights History and Comments on the Submission of G. Thompson. The first page of that report did set out the planning permit history of the subdivision. Now, a close-up of one of the entries of that history list is on the screen now and as you can see that entry records the fact that K.R. and Wire Buchanan were the owners at the time of the issue of the planning permit. Each and every one of the entries on that list has the name of the subdivider at the time of issue of the various permits. Okay, so, to the right of the screen now, is the essentially identically headed planning permit history which the council and its solicitor gave in evidence before the tribunal. You will observe that the owner's name is very purposefully omitted from the list which was submitted to the tribunal. That omission was in order to facilitate the overtly fraudulent representation to the tribunal that the timeshare company had been the subdivider slash developer since 1976. That document was fabricated by the council and uttered by Ian Lonnie for the purpose of fraud and perverting the course of justice and concealing the fraud of the council. Okay, so now a few snippets as to why the entire council and its executive were engaged in malicious fraud against me. Now, as discussed earlier, in 1980, the council issued the planning permit which permitted subdivision of each existing allotment into three smaller allotments. Those permitted smaller allotments were in breach of the council policy for minimum allotment sizes for the area concerned. That permit was issued while the council knew full well that the allotments were in multiple ownerships and while the council knew well that the proposed timeshare company was not even incorporated. So the council issued that permit in the careless and reckless expectation that the in fact, non-existent, timeshare company would purchase and use all of the allotments as timeshare allotments. Then, as discussed earlier, in 1984, the council forced me to cancel my proposed sale of my land. So, in respect of these things, in his report, the Shire engineer, said several things. Firstly he said what's on the screen now, as you can see he said that the council was faced with a problem when it became known that the cluster subdivision was in multiple ownership. Now, the fact, of course, known to Wilson and the council, was that the timeshare company had failed to purchase my land. Wilson then made direct reference to the council forcing the cancellation of the 1984 auction of my land. At that time, I had attempted to sell the original allotments, which I had purchased in 1979. Wilson said out that the reason why that sale was prevented was the new owners would have been able to exercise the right to subdivide each of my allotments into the three smaller allotments. So, the council's problem and my problem, arose because the council had issued that planning permit on the baseless and careless and reckless expectation that the then yet to be incorporated timeshare company would purchase my land. The council's problem was that if such smaller blocks were in the hands of private individuals, such as myself, the adjacent landholders would have the expectation that they could subdivide their land into similar size allotments. The council and its executive and each and every individual councillor then resorted to the fraud which I have just discussed, and which fraud was calculated by them to prevent me from selling my land to anyone other than the timeshare company which wished to exploit that fraud by the council to obtain my land at a fraction of its true value. Okay, so now back to the corruption of Redlick and Osborne. At the hearing before Osborne, I made the written allegation the price and guard had deceived the tribunal. I also exhibited guard's written submission to the tribunal. I also said that if guard had not deceived the tribunal the great probability was that I would not have suffered the loss and damage and the hearing before Osborne would not be occurring. Then for the purpose of falsifying the fact that guard had deceived the tribunal Osborne fabricated paragraphs 18 and 19 of his purported reasons. Now, Osborne's paragraphs 17, 18, and 19 are back on the screen. As you can see those paragraphs essentially repeat the substance of the fraudulent submissions which Price and Guard and Lonnie and the Council and Water Authority made to the Tribunal. By fraudulently representing those things as the factual background Osborne maliciously and criminally falsified my truthful allegations against Price and Guard. Osborne then fabricated the entire balance of his purported reasons to flow from and provide verisimilitude to his initial fabrications. By his overtly fraudulent purported reasons Osborne also concealed the fact that the A and Z subsidiary knowingly and fraudulently sold my land in the circumstances of the fraud which it and Price and Guard had perpetuated. Now, just to round off, the fact known to Redlick, was that my 1995 proceeding alleged that the Council and Water Authority had fraudulently concealed the fact that the non-domestic water supply from the lake was the approved, and only legitimate reticulated water supply and they concealed my entitlement to that non-domestic supply. That 1995 proceeding then alleged that the council fraudulently represented that the water supply from the water board was the precondition to use of my land. Again, my viewers, links to a copy of the writ and statement of claim in that 1995 proceeding are in the description of this video. 
Significantly, that fraud by the Council and Water Authority was continuous during the period about April 1983 until the ANZ subsidiary sold my land in February 1990. So, for a period of about eight years each and every councillor, and each and every Water Authority member slash director, and their respective executive, were malicious and criminal party to that heinous fraud. For the purpose of that fraud, the Council and Water Authority fraudulently concealed the fact that the non-domestic water supply from the lake was the approved, and only lawful reticulated water supply and they concealed the fact that roof rainwater tanks were the approved and only legitimate source of domestic water. During that period, the Council and Water Authority continuously denied me access to relevant council records. In 1995, after the restructuring of local government in Victoria, and after the council executive had been retrenched, I was given access to the council records and discovered the foregoing heinous fraud. Then on 26th of October 1995, I issued the Supreme Court writ in the 1995 proceeding referred to in Osborne's paragraph 19. As discussed at the beginning of this video, while he was a judge of the Victorian Court of Appeal, the now Victorian Anti-Corruption Commissioner, Robert Redlick, fabricated his purported reasons for the purpose of concealing the overtly corrupt conduct of Osborne and Guard. At the time of composing and publishing his purposefully fabricated purported reasons for judgment, Robert Redlick was well aware that he was committing a heinous and criminal fraud against the people of Victoria and particularly against me and my family. There are numerous other, complementary, fraudulent fabrications, in Redlick's fabricated reasons. I will describe those further, overt fabrications, in future videos. Robert Redlick is a high-order common criminal. Robert Redlick is a damn liar who intentionally deceived the people of Victoria for the purpose of concealing the criminal conduct of his friends. I will see Redlick and Osborne and a number of other similarly corrupt Victorian judges incarcerated. At that time, in the Victorian Court of Appeal, each and every Court of Appeal judge, shown on the screen now, was sufficiently aware of the foregoing matters and things and much more. In those circumstances, each and every one of those judges made orders and published purported reasons which were contrived to deceive the people of Victoria and deny and conceal the overt corrupt and criminal conduct which I have briefly outlined in this video. On the face of it, at the present time, and for at least the past 40 years, the justice system of Victoria is utterly corrupt. Now, one final and most serious aspect of this particular instance of overt judicial corruption is that in the hearing before Osborne, Guard was acting as the senior barrister for the Water Authority. My allegations against Guard were made in a written submission to Osborne. Immediately after I introduced that submission Osborne called an adjournment, during that adjournment Osborne retired and Guard disappeared from the court precinct, none of the other lawyers disappeared. Guard then reappeared moments before Osborne. Then, shortly after the resumption, Osborne and Guard performed a discussion routine that was substantially led and prompted by Osborne. During that routine, Guard and Osborne placed what they knew to be palpably false assertions and comments on the transcript record. Osborne then used that flagrantly false material, sometimes word for word, in his fraudulently falsified purported reasons. It is now apparent, that during the adjournment, Osborne and Guard jointly planned Osborne's subsequent fabrications. By registered mail of 10th of June 2014, I sent the previous Chief Justice, Marilyn Warren, and the then Attorney General, Martin Pakula, a substantial letter which, with exhibits, extensively set out Osborne's fabrications and in particular set out that in open court Osborne and Guard had performed the routine which I have just described. A copy of that letter is available on my website courtsontrial.com. A link to my website is included in the description to this video. I will soon make a video dedicated to that particularly sordid aspect where, for the purpose of concealing court-based corruption and committing judicial fraud against me, Guard and Osborne fearlessly conspired with one another in open court. Finally, the earlier overt corrupt conduct of the ANZ subsidiary in conspiracy with its solicitor caused me great loss and damage and led to the forced sale of my first family home. By the time of the hearings before Osborne and Redlick, I had financially recovered and had purchased a second family home. In purported pursuance of their overtly fabricated purported reasons, Osborne and Redlick and other similarly corrupt judges ordered that I pay the legal fees of the Council and Water Authority. Those fees included the fees of the then crooked barrister, Greg Gard. His fees were incurred while he concealed that the entire saga arose as a consequence of the fact that he conspired with the ANZ. Solicitor John Norman Price to commit fraud upon the earlier court and to perpetuate the fraud that had been described in the Victorian Parliament. Those fees were almost $1 million. I paid in cash. That left me essentially destitute, and I fell into default with my mortgage to the ANZ Bank. 
with sufficient knowledge of the foregoing matters and things, the directors and executives of the ANZ Bank refused to stand against the corruption of which they had abundant, ineluctable evidence, and they refused to allow me a moratorium on my home mortgage. They instead chose to force the sale of my second family home. My second family home was thereby effectively also lost to the overt fraud of the ANZ subsidiary. The ANZ solicitor acting in that forced sale was Susan Forrest of Gadden Solicitors, Queensland. She was also adequately aware of the foregoing and predictably, she, as a solicitor, did not have the courage or integrity to stand against the corruption of which she had sufficient knowledge. In my view, the directors and executives of the ANZ Bank and Miss Susan Forrest are one small level below Osborne and Redlick in providing an environment where serious corruption is assured. Now, my viewers, I have much, much more equally serious material to come. If you are interested in fighting, or at least opposing, corruption, like and share this video, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, click on the link to a further corruption video which will soon appear towards the lower left of the screen. I'm going to succeed, to put it in the old Australian vernacular, I'm going to have their guts for garters. The end. We shall see.